Well, we're so fortunate today to have with us Donald Sadaway. He is the co-founder and the chief scientific advisor for Ambry, which is a battery company. Thank you so much, Donald, for being with us today. My pleasure. So I thought we'd just start real quickly with you're working on this battery technology. Uh, we're kind of familiar on this channel with Tesla batteries, lithium ion batteries. Uh, yours are kind of big and kind of hot. Uh, why do we need your batteries? Well, uh, you want different kinds of batteries for different applications. So uh, the lithium ion battery is a, it's a fantastic battery. It's given us so much that we treasure in the modern world. Um, and it was uh, invented for handheld devices. Uh, it was originally uh, something that came out of Sony uh, for their uh, handheld cameras. And then it migrated into uh, mobile phones and laptop computers and more recently has found its way into uh, electric vehicles. Uh, but when we start thinking about grid level storage, if you want to, uh, to pair batteries with um, solar or wind, which are intermittent, you need something uh, a little more robust than uh, the battery that was designed for your mobile phone. And so that's, that's what I turned my attention to. And that's, that's what gave birth to the, the liquid metal battery. So when we're talking about liquid metal, you know, I'm familiar with mercury. It's, uh, you know, it's liquid at room temperature, but uh, your batteries aren't made out of mercury. So how are they liquid? So they have to run at elevated temperature. So um, an example is uh, the, the first battery that we, uh, that uh, I, when I say we, I mean uh, I with uh, my students and postdocs at MIT. Uh, the first battery we worked on was uh, magnesium uh, opposite antimony, and uh, these metals melt uh, around 630, 650 degrees Celsius. So we had to go up to about 700 degrees Celsius. And um, you might say, well, gee, that's that's very high temperature, but um, imagine a battery, say, the size of a shipping container. It would be insulated so that it would be cool to the touch on the outside, but inside it would be operating at this elevated temperature. And so how do these batteries work? Like, uh, why elevate the temperature of metal and, and do all this work when we have, you know, lithium ion batteries that work at room temperature? There's a push and a pull here. So uh, the pull is that uh, these uh, batteries uh, operating at elevated temperature uh, can cycle uh, with very, very high uh, charging and discharging rates. And um, they can also cycle deep discharge many times, uh, thousands of cycles, and uh, without capacity fade. In other words, after we have data from, from Ambry, after uh, 5,000 cycles, uh, the batteries are still retaining 99 plus percent of their original uh, charge. So these are, these are powerful advantages because if you, if you put batteries on the grid, you're not going to change them every two, three years the way you do with your phone or your laptop computer. You want to put them there for, for 20 years. And uh, that means you have to have batteries that don't lose their capacity. So, so th these are some of the advantages that you get from um, the uh, liquid metal battery. And also the price point is very, very low. But uh, the other thing is the, the disadvantages of uh, lithium ion. Lithium ion works beautifully in, in the small format. But if you start putting uh, hundreds of thousands of lithium ion batteries in close proximity, you're going to have to uh, be very aggressive about uh, thermal management because they're going to heat up. And if they heat up, they could uh, go uh, super critical and uh, burst into flame and so on. There's an optimum application for uh, these various battery chemistries. And I think that when you go to grid level storage, uh, lithium ion might not be the, the best fit. I mean, we, we see some evidence of lithium ion being deployed, but um, I think in terms of round trip efficiency and, and safety and, and uh, long service lifetime, I think liquid metal battery is a better fit. That's a really interesting point because, uh, yeah, we're, we're thinking about like, oh, you got to keep these batteries warm, but you're right, we have to keep lithium ion batteries cooler. That's correct. So lithium, uh, lithium ion uh, has a problem of uh, thermal runaway. Um, a liquid metal, we got to keep them from freezing. So it's, uh, it's the, the, the polar opposite. But, uh, you know, the worst thing happens if, if, the, lithium, if the liquid metal uh, freezes, so what? So we'll have to inject some heat and remelt them and keep them moving. 
If lithium ion uh, gets too hot and bursts into flame, there's no turning back on that one. So I'd, 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 I'd rather be dealing with the, the cool down problem rather than the, than the heat up problem. So Don, let's talk about how your batteries actually work. And we're lucky because you're a professor, so you're good at explaining things. So could you just kind of give us the broad overview of how your batteries work? The way the liquid metal battery works is, first of all, you gotta imagine what uh, it looks like inside. There's three layers. There's a top layer, which is a uh, low density liquid metal, and that's gonna be the negative electrode. And then underneath that is a molten salt, which is the electrolyte. And then beneath that is the high density liquid metal, which is the positive electrode. So you got two electrodes separated by an electrolyte. That's the workings of every battery. And in this instance, the metals are insoluble in the salt and the salt is insoluble in the metals. So these three layers, even though they're all liquid, they don't mix, they stratify, sort of like salad oil and vinegar, only in this case you have three layers, not two. The energy is stored in these uh, liquid metal electrodes. So when you go to discharge, to discharge the battery, you want to draw current. You connect the electrodes across some load, and some appliance, what have you. And um, the, the way the current is generated, the metal of the top electrode wants to alloy with the metal in the bottom electrode. But I just told you, they don't, they're not soluble. So the only way the metal from the top electrode can get to the bottom electrode is for the metal of the top electrode to become an ion. So it becomes an ion, and then the ion goes across the electrolyte and meets the uh, positive electrode, where the electrons that have been generated have gone through the external circuit, and then they combine with the ion to make it into a neutral metal. And now the top layer is getting thinner, the bottom layer is getting thicker, and that's how we generate the current. And so then to do it in reverse, I assume you, instead of uh, hooking it up to a load, you hook it up to a power source. And does everything just magically work backwards? That's it, exactly. You force current through the system. And when you force current through the system, that prompts the uh, bottom layer, which is now the mixture of metals. It prompts the metal that's normally in the top layer to jump back into the electrolyte, swim to the top, and recombine to regenerate the top layer. And so uh, th this is tantamount to uh, what we call in uh, metallurgy, electro-refining. And so you're gonna purify the metal in the bottom layer, and you're gonna purify the electrolyte, and you're gonna reconstitute the top layer uh, with high purity metal. And so by charging the battery, you essentially return it to its pristine initial state. And maybe that accounts for why we can cycle these things for thousands of cycles without loss of capacity. Because there's no, you know, layers and rolls and, uh, you know, all the complicated parts of a lithium ion battery kind of just go away and you're, and you're left with a box with a bunch of molten metal in it. That's correct. The In the lithium ion battery, for example, uh, on discharge, when the lithium ion enters the positive electrode, uh, there's uh, something like uh, lithium cobalt oxide, lithium nickel oxide, lithium manganese oxide. And when the lithium goes into that uh, structure, it causes a little bit of an expansion. And then when we charge the battery, uh, the lithium leaves, and then there's a little bit of a contraction. And it's sort of like if you've ever taken a coat hanger and bent it back and forth, a number of times you can do it, and then after some point, uh, it snaps. And that's exactly what happens inside the lithium ion battery. Uh, cycling leads to uh, decrepitation of some of the particles in the positive electrode. And we don't have any of that because, you know, I like to say that liquids have no memory. So all of this battery is working at elevated temperatures. We're talking uh, hundreds of degrees Celsius. So what happens if you don't keep heating it and it cools off? Is that bad? Uh, yes and no. Uh, if, it, if it freezes, then it won't be able to pass current. But uh, we've done uh, uh, many, many tests. Uh, that's part of the, the testing routine is to see if it survives a freeze and thaw cycle. And uh, it will do so. so. So you might say, well, then, you know, how's this thing supposed to work then if, if you've got to keep it at temperature? 
So um, imagine a duty cycle that uh, involves, say, um, four or five hours of discharge. Let's say it's paired to uh, solar. So the sun goes down and you still want to be able to draw electricity uh, into, the, into the night. And so you might want to have these things running for four or five hours. And as the current is flowing through the external circuit, there's also an ionic current flowing between the electrodes inside the cell. And that ionic current generates heat desirably. Not like in lithium ion where you got to manage that heat. In this case, we want that heat. And then the battery sits idle for say seven or eight hours. And then the sun comes up and you use some of the sunlight to recharge the battery. And as you're recharging the battery, ion flow again generates heat. And so if we're clever about how we uh, insulate the cells, and by the way, the battery has a plurality of cells. There's hundreds of these cells in close proximity. They will generate enough heat to heat their neighbors, and then the ones on the periphery have insulation around them. And with that kind of a duty cycle, we can have these things run uh, in perpetuity, just uh, heating themselves just through normal use discharge and charge. So that's that's how the thing is run. So this makes a lot of sense. You had your first placement, I think, in a big uh, scale use at a Terascale's data center in um, is it Arizona or New Mexico, which is a hot state. And that totally makes sense for your battery. But what I'm wondering is why did they choose your battery over, let's say, the Tesla battery like the one in Hornsdale? Was it just because of the heat or is there some other reason? Well, I think it's a combination. Uh, the the fact that uh, they're, they're in the high desert, um, it means that just the, the ambient temperature can already get up to uh, uh, 40, 50 degrees Celsius. And for lithium ion, if it gets, if it gets above about 65 Celsius, you better start uh, in uh, major intervention. Otherwise, it could get uh, too hot and then you could have thermal runaway and fire. So it, it really makes sense to, to use a battery that, that uh, thrives in, in the hot environment. Um, and uh, so I think that, that was the, the primary uh, factor in their choice. But also, I mean, it's, it's the cost of ownership. I mean, you can say everything you want about the attributes of liquid metal battery, but if it's priced uh, way out of range, then people are going to uh, take deep uh, gulp and, and go with lithium ion. Uh, so it's, it's a combination of uh, performance requirements and, uh, and cost of ownership. I, I, I always like to talk about the price performance ratio. And is this the kind of technology you like many that as you guys scale up the price of the battery is going to come down? For sure. For sure. As you get beyond a certain um, output, uh, you really get to the economy of scale. Below that uh, output, uh, you really have to struggle to amortize the capital cost of building the plant and, and so on and so forth. But like we're seeing with lithium ion batteries, do we need to worry about getting to scale in terms of materials? Like, uh, you know, people are worried about, are we gonna have enough uh, nickel and enough cobalt and enough graphite to go into lithium ion batteries? Is this a major concern for your batteries? No, and uh, one of the, um, one of the uh, principles that I uh, adopted when we first started the work at, at, at MIT back in the, in the uh, early 2000s, around 2008, 2009, was that I, I thought about um, scale right at the beginning. So I, I coined this term cost-informed discovery. In other words, you don't, you know, the, the university model is invent the coolest chemistry and um, uh, make it fantastic, don't worry about cost, make something that's going to get you into the high impact journals and so on and, and maybe you flip it over the transom and, and uh, give it to the manufacturing guys and let them chase down the cost curve. And I, I reasoned that in this application that wouldn't be good enough. You have to think about cost on day one. And so I, I said, you know, you have to think about the elements that are going to go into this battery so that it will be uh, cost effective. And part and parcel of that is the supply chain. And so uh, if, if you make the battery out of exotic uh, elements that come from uh, remote parts of the world, and uh, in some cases uh, they're not ethically sourced, in some cases you've got concerns about uh, political stability and so on, 
then you're, you're really building a, a rickety technology. I like to say if you want to make something dirt cheap, make it out of dirt, and preferably dirt that's locally sourced. So if, if, I, if I take a, a, a shovel full of dirt out of my own backyard and put it on the lab bench and tell my students, you got to make a battery out of what's in that pile of dirt. I know that when we make a battery, it's going to be dirt cheap and I got a secure supply chain. So we thought about that from the beginning. And if you take a look at the kinds of uh, metals that we're working with, uh, the stuff that Ambry's uh, pursuing right now involves calcium and antimony. And the, the salt is calcium chloride, which is road salt. That's what we're throwing on the, on the road uh, today because I can see it's snowing right now. And uh, we'll be using calcium chloride on the, on the sidewalks and on the roadways. So we've given uh, considerable thought to making sure that the uh, constituents, the components, are earth abundant, ethically sourced, and uh, uh, with a secure supply chain. All right. So to add on to your question, Jesse, um, you know, are the materials abundant? But when you get to like a lithium ion battery, you have to have like almost near perfect material. So you can't just throw any old lithium that you picked up off the ground. You've got to get it to, you know, 99.9999%. Um, is that true in your battery as well? Uh, do the materials have to be perfect? No, that's another thing that's a uh, uh, redeeming feature of the liquid metal battery. Um, obviously, we don't we don't go out of our way to, to use uh, heavily contaminated uh, components, but uh, it turns out that uh, by cycling, uh, going through the discharge and charge cycle, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the charge cycle is tantamount to electro refining. So after uh, a dozen or so cycles, uh, the impurities that would have been present in some of the constituents are going to get refined out and uh, then the battery just hums along. So I have this dream of one day, hopefully soon, of a virtual power plant uh, across the world where there's not just these, you know, gigantic uh, coal burning power plants, but that we have, you know, solar on the roof, we have wind turbines, and then we have batteries everywhere. Does the Ambry battery fit into that? Do you have that same feeling about the future? What are your thoughts about the future of renewables? Well, I think that uh, renewables have a big role to play in the future. And uh, of course, renewables, uh, the wind and uh, solar are intermittent. And so uh, if we can't treat their intermittency, they can't be fully integrated into base load, which means we're going to have to have something else. And where we can have uh, uh, hydro and, uh, and nuclear, uh, they, can, they can fill those gaps. But otherwise, we're going to still have to rely on uh, combustion of fossil fuels. So I think batteries are a, a critical component in uh, widespread adoption of uh, renewables to, to make us uh, fully uh, sustainable on the grid. The end of life for batteries is a big problem, especially with lithium ion. Not too many people that we've talked to yet have come up with a great solution. It seems like it's being a little bit kicked down the road. Um, what is it like for your battery at end of life? I know it's 20 years away, but uh, is it recyclable? Absolutely. That's, you know, I, I, I've just told you that the uh, that when we charge a battery, uh, we're essentially running an electro refinery. So let's say it's the end of life. And by the way, the, the, the battery doesn't fade. So, so what's the end of life look like? Well, the battery's been running at, uh, say, 500 degrees Celsius for, for 20 years. Uh, it's in a steel container. Maybe at some point, just to be prudent, we might say, let's, let's shut these down and, and, uh, and put them into new steel containers. The steel that was used that can go into a electric arc furnace and be recycled. And then the contents, the liquid metal, well, obviously the metal at room temperature will be solid, but the, but the two metals and, and the salt, that can all be recycled. So, you know, it, it's not as though there's this uh, colossal problem of disposal. Uh, in point of fact, uh, there are very high level of uh, uh, utilization and it's not repurposing. In other words, uh, if you look at some polymers, for example, if you start off with a high, highly functional polymer, um, it, it can't be remelted because of the covalent bonds and so on. So maybe it'll be shredded and, and turned into some other application, but it, it sort of cascades down in utility. The, the liquid metal batteries will be reused as batteries so that once they enter the, the, uh, the market, 
they will come back as uh, storage devices, um, essentially in perpetuity. I want to go back to the heat for a second. I know it seems really obvious now that we should use these batteries in places where they already are hot environments like the high desert. But in the future, could we use these batteries in a place where we could use the heat? So could we use them, let's say, uh, in a, you know, in Finland or Alaska and then use the heat to help heat a building? Yeah, in principle, the, there there is heat uh, that's being generated and, and we're trying to keep the heat from from escaping because we want to keep the batteries at temperature. But if if you wanted to, have a heat exchanger in with inside the the container. That's a candidate for conversation. I've also been approached by some people who have said, "Well, what about thermoelectrics? You could take the heat and and use it to generate even more electricity." And all of these things are um, up for uh, discussion. So one of the things that really fascinates me is the future, and it sounds like your batteries are going to help be a part of that future and. Uh, as we go forward, I'm excited about, you know, people traveling to Mars and establishing, you know, Mars civilizations. Do you think that your battery would work on Mars a little bit better than it would, say, a lithium ion battery? Be it just because the materials might be a little bit easier to, to access and, and refine? Uh, it's, it's funny you ask that question. I I've actually been thinking about batteries uh, on uh, extraterrestrial bodies and, uh, and using the same principles. Uh, as, I, as I used here. In other words, uh, uh, if here I say they should be earth abundant and, and uh, ethically sourced and so on, well then, you know, if I were required to build a battery that would function on Mars, uh, would I do something similar? In other words, use resources that are available on Mars that would give me a, a battery. And I've also been doing some, some work uh, recently thinking about uh, battery design that would operate on the moon. And, uh, and I'm not making this up. Uh, I was approached by some NASA people last year. They want to send a mission to Venus. Uh, it'll be geophysical. They're going to land a device on Venus and it's going to take geophysical data. And they want to send information back to, to Earth. And they need uh, a power supply. And they, the surface of Venus is 460 degrees Celsius, and uh, it's supercritical carbon dioxide. So, I mean, it's, it's CO2 to be sure, supercritical CO2. And they said, what about liquid metal battery? I said, no problem. So, uh, yeah, I, I, the, the whole idea of uh, liquid metal battery is... Uh, uh, it's quite appealing to me. When you developed your battery, we were in the midst of, I guess, switching from nickel metal hydride to lithium ion batteries. But your chemistry, your idea is so far different than that. Where did you get your idea to do it this way? This is probably around 2005. And, uh, you know, lithium ion has uh, starting to take hold uh, in, in uh, applications for mobile devices, uh, cell phones and, and computers. And people are starting to ask questions about uh, massive storage. And at the time at MIT, I had two major uh, threads in uh, applied electrochemistry. One of them was batteries. I'd done some work on early uh, lithium uh, polymer battery. Um, and then in the 2000s decided I was gonna turn my attention to massive storage. The other area that I worked in is in uh, uh, electrometallurgy in electrolytic extraction of metals, aluminum, magnesium, titanium, uh, the alkali metals, and all of this is high temperature, liquid metals, molten salts. And so I, I looked at an, an aluminum smelter, and this is something that operates 24-7. Uh, it consumes huge amounts of electricity, and in doing so, turns uh, aluminum oxide into liquid aluminum. And uh, it's got a molten salt as a solvent. And I looked at that and I said, man, if, if, if I could figure out how to take that thing and not have it consume electricity, but store electricity, and then release that electricity on demand, I know at the end of the day, I'd have something that's massive and traffics in large amounts of electricity. And by the way, you can turn dirt into metal 
for aluminum at less than 50 cents a pound. So I know it'd be big and it would be cheap. And so that was where I, I got my inspiration from. I didn't consult with the battery experts. If I'd consulted with battery experts, I would have ended up at the end of the uh, same dead end as everybody else. So I, I looked outside the, the field for inspiration and looked for something that's, that's massive and, and traffics in large amounts of electricity as opposed to everybody else who is looking at, you know, a, a double A cell and f trying to figure out how to make it the size of a, of a 40 foot shipping container. You're in a really interesting position as a professor at MIT. I mean, you're in an enviable position because you're around so many smart people, you yourself, but also your students who I imagine must be a huge source of inspiration for you. And then talking about your company, Ambry, uh, you've got students who are now part of the company. Tell me what what's that like to go from being a professor to then a uh, head of a company and running a co uh, starting a company. Well, it's it's very gratifying to, uh, to first of all to work with young people. You're absolutely correct. These people are are bright and they also are highly motivated. I mean, th the reason they the reason they join my research group is uh, that uh, quite simply they just want to change the world. That's all. And so they're, they're inspired. They really want to uh, do something significant. It's not just a matter of getting another journal article published and so on. So it, it's, it's really fun. And by the way, I, um, when, when I really expanded the effort around 2010, and my group uh, swelled to, I had over 20 people working uh, for a number of years on the liquid metal battery. And the vast majority of them were not electrochemists. They had no prior experience with electrochemistry or liquid metals or molten salts. They came to me, they're bright, I mean, they're at MIT, but they were, they were not the experts, they were the anti-experts. And these people, they brought fresh perspective and, and it was a joy to work with them. And then several of my uh, former students who were uh, working on this project came to me and said, we have to start a company and we want to get uh, the technology uh, into the hands of uh, the public. We want science and service to society, and we have to have a company. So, okay, I was persuaded, we started the company, but I very quickly uh, empowered the people at the company to, to run with it. I'm not there on a regular basis, micromanaging and so on. I, I believe in, in fostering the young people and uh, fostering the technology. So there are two outcomes from the research. You get the, uh, the technology product and you get the new people. So I talk about uh, inventing inventors. And, and so with that as the backdrop, uh, at Ambry, you know, I, I, make, uh, I make appearances infrequently. These people are in charge. So you have this battery, it's, it sounds pretty simple. I take a bunch of stuff put it into a box, heat up the box, get myself some electricity. Sounds pretty easy. Why, what's stopping anyone from doing this? This sound, I mean. You can start a battery company now. <laughs> you just put some, uh, what, what do you put some, you know, calcium antimony in a thing, get some, you know, some salt, bada bing, bada boom. I got myself a battery. Yeah, I thought the same thing, but that was 10 years ago. And uh, so it's a long, let, let's just say it's a long road from the lab bench to the marketplace. And so we were able to demonstrate the technology at the, at the size of a, of a coffee cup at MIT. But now to be able to build these things uh, reliably, you know, to Six Sigma uh, uh, reliability, we had to invent not only the battery, but also the battery manufacturing. And there was nobody to turn to. We could take the smartest people in the world who make the best lithium ion batteries most efficiently and they would look at what we have to do and say i can't help you because the lithium ion battery is so different from what we have and so we in in 2010 were where lithium ion was in 1990 and look at lithium ion 1990 2000 2010 2020 30 years hence for the first time we see lithium ion batteries that are coming down to the price of uh, in the vicinity of $100 per kilowatt hour. Well, I started in 2010. I've only been at this for 10 years. It, it shows you just how difficult it is to break into this uh, area. We call this tough tech. 
This is tough tech. This is not like writing code. Writing code is just time on task. You'll get there. This, we have to invent the manufacturing process, the manufacturing machinery, and on and on and on. And that's why it's such a long journey. So Donna, what is the roadmap going forward for Ambry? Um, I know we have a lot of investors watching the show right now who are probably pretty excited if they could get in on investing. Are you planning on an IPO at some point? Uh, what, what, are the, what are the plans? At the moment, uh, there's a, a fundraise in, in progress. Uh, I, don't, I don't believe that any, anybody is talking about IPO, uh, but uh, there's uh, a fundraise to uh, take us to the next stage. Hopefully this, this will be the last major fundraise, which will allow us to uh, produce uh, product and get it into uh, first customer hands. Um, and so uh, if, if people want, uh, they should uh, contact uh, Ambry and uh, hopefully we'll finish this job. It's a big journey and I would like to see us cross the finish line soon. That's really exciting. I mean, it's exciting to hear that uh, customers can now start reaching out to you. And I mean, just like, you know, TerraScale did maybe start getting Ambry batteries into their you know, prod into their, you know, grid storage or into their data servers, because I mean, what a great way to get ourselves off of fossil fuels. I agree. I agree. Uh, the battery is the uh, is the missing piece. And uh, Without storage, uh, all of the other efforts at uh, intermittent uh, carbon-free renewables uh, will uh, come to a grinding halt. So um, I see a, a need and uh, I want to, uh, to meet that need. All right, so Don, we're just uh, up the road from you because uh, you're down in, in Marlboro, Mass. Uh, maybe when COVID's all over, we can get, uh, come take a visit. Jesse basically wants to steal one of your batteries and put it on the set, I think is what he's driving at. <laughs> yeah, that's that's pretty much what I want. I want to have a battery. It doesn't have to be at temperature or anything, but I definitely want to have one. It, it would just be so cool. Well, I think you have an open invitation. Once once uh, we get this COVID uh, business behind us, uh, by all means, uh, come to come to Ambry and uh, we'll show you how the, how the sausage is made. That's awesome. exciting. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank I you. can't wait. You're welcome.